Hope everybody had a good day today. I know for a fact that everybody had a day today. So, whether it was good or not, I don't know. But you had one. You had a day. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Sprecking in the tongues. I covered most of what I wanted to say on this last week. Seems like there was an assignment I gave everybody. You know, if I don't remember it, then you didn't have to do it. I don't know, I don't know that I did. I don't know that I did. You what? You're sticking with it. I don't blame you for that. Um, yeah. Anyway, Acts chapter 2, we're going to move right along, take a look at what's happening here on this day. And um, again, I, I, I want to say this, if, for anybody that's listening, um, I, don't just, I don't just preach to the people that are here because uh, it's a lot more than that, uh, the pe number of people that we reach, the number of pastors, especially in Kenya, uh, and their churches. Um, they um, they listen. They listen to the, the sermons, the teachings on the radio over there. And um, one of the things that I heard was going on, and I really like it, there is a, a big time false prophet in Kenya. He goes by the name of Dr. Awar. And um, I didn't really know how big he was um, when I went out to Kenya to dedicate the well that we had dug in Samburu um, I remember landing uh, you know the the plane landing there in Nairobi airport and as I'm getting off the plane I know there's people everywhere and they're not getting on a plane they're waiting and I'm going are they waiting on me? Because some of them are holding up, you know, pastor, we miss you or something like that. And I'm going, they're not, surely they're not all waiting for me. And I got my luggage and got through it. I mean, the parking lot was full of people. And uh, so then I see Michael and our driver and they pick me up and I said, what are all these people here for? And he said, you didn't know? I said, no, what? I said, Dr. Awar was on the same plane with you. I said, well, I didn't see him. They said, well, of course you didn't see him. You're riding in the back. He's up there on the front, you know, getting champagne and wine brought to him. And it, I mean, there was thousands of people there waiting for him to get off that plane. He has got those people. And this is what makes me mad. Okay. I, I don't want to belittle anybody but in a in a place where people are not very well educated he takes advantage of that he takes great advantage of that and um, those people will follow him if he if he told them they all had to die within a week to go to heaven they'd find some way of dying I mean that's the kind of power there's pictures of him with people bowing down to him and that really made me upset there's other things about him that I have heard I believe them whether they're true or not I don't know but I have heard them and I believe them but anybody with that much power man's not supposed to have that a preacher's not supposed to have that kind of power and um, so anyway I just make it a point whenever I can to try to discourage people from even listening to him and one of the things that I, uh, I heard uh, was happening was the, the pastors there uh, in Samburu and Turkana were saying, you know what, we're just going to follow the, what the Bible says and go by it. You know, forget about Dr. O'Ward. And I'm going, yes, 
making people, I like it when people are free. Guys like that will put him in bondage. He'll put him in bondage every time. He will demand that they, and those people, they don't have any money, but what money they get, he'll demand it from them. And he lives high on the Kenyan hog out there. And most of the pastors, uh, the good guys in Kenya, they barely survive. In fact, one pastor, I remember we were um, loading up. We were in this when we were in Rongo, Alicia. And um, one of the pastors asked me, he said, and he took me aside. I guess he didn't want everybody to hear it, but he said, I need to ask you a question and your opinion about something. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, um, do you get paid by your church? I said, yes, I do. And he said, and you're saying that that's biblical? I said, it absolutely is. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Careth God for oxen? No. He's talking about those who labor in the word. That, and I said, the Levite priest were the recipients of the tithe and of the offerings, the sacrifices. They got a, they got a worthy portion of it. And I said, that was for their, their livelihood. That was for them to feed their families with. And whatever tithe came in, they received a portion of it because God did not allow them to have land to work land and raise cattle and raise vineyards and things like that. And I said, so they were reserved by God for doing his work and in order for them to feed themselves and their family and take care of them. They were the recipients of the tithes and the offerings that came in. And I said, it's the same thing now. If you labor in the word for your people's sake, then um, you need to sit down with them and um, show them the scriptures that I told you and sit down and say, look, I'm not trying to be rich here, but you've asked me to labor in the word and it is, it is not right for me to labor all day and then I have to go out and find some way of feeding my family. It's just not right. And um, so I've, I've often prayed for the pastors out there and um, back a couple years ago when we had some really, really sizable donations uh, brought in, uh, I was uh, giving, uh, there was, we had a list of pastors in San Bruno and a list of past, uh, pastors in Turkana. And uh, we, were, we were giving them a, uh, a disbursement of $100 each uh, a month for as long as we had the money. And um, they just, they were just like, praise the Lord, you know. But I just wanted those people to know that uh, I wasn't there to take anything from them. I was there to give. And uh, that's what I think it's all about. All right. Um, Acts chapter 2. Let's uh, read the, the text here. And then we'll move on down. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And Holy Ghost is actually two words. Because I hear a lot of, especially a lot of southern preachers, it's Holy Ghost. It's one, one word, two syllables, Holy Ghost. And um, no, it's two, actually two words. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, one thing I want to throw in here and we'll go to prayer. English as a language at this time did not exist. 
There was no such language as English. And I used to have, I don't know what's, I haven't seen him or heard from him in a long time, but there used to be a guy back years ago that followed us online. He had this idea that the original language in the Garden of Eden was English. That's what he said. And... Um, so that's, I mean, he believed, obviously he believed in the King James. He said God basically was restoring with the King James Bible that language. Because that was the original language. And he also believed that whenever he would, he would write me and chew me out. Because his idea was that all I should do is read the scriptures to you. Add no more to it. Don't talk about it. Don't expound on it uh, and when we sang we must be singing scripture verses and we couldn't say anything else except scripture no explanation uh, in the in the days when Ezra stood up behind a pulpit of wood the Bible says they read for part of the day and then they gave the meaning and caused them to understand the sense of it in other words they they taught it okay and um, but he said, no, we're not supposed to be doing any of that. And he, he was a smart man. He was a real estate salesman and, or a broker of some kind. And I'm like, surely you don't believe this. I mean, you seem to be an intelligent guy. But that's what he believed. And he, yeah, he never would stop. So English did not exist at this time. Uh, more than likely, one of these languages here and I'd, I've done some, a little bit of research on it. I can't remember which of them, which, which it was. But one of these languages here eventually crept into uh, what we know as the Gothic language. And the Gothic language is sort of like where English got its start. And I don't want to get into whole the history of English language. But anyway, that's... Uh, there was no English at this time. So anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. Thank you, God, for gathering us here in this place. Pray, Lord, that you'd bless all of those who are here, those who are watching online, those who will watch us later. Uh, Lord, help us to be a blessing to each and every one. We pray this in Jesus' name and amen. Now, um, we talked last Wednesday about this idea of a, that they were speaking some, uh, they were speaking an angelic language at this time. And they say that they all spoke this angel language, but that the people that were there between their mouth and their ear, it got turned over to their language, which they could hear. That's, that's the theory, is that they insist that what was coming out of the mouth of all these men, these disciples, was an angelic language that no one knows, but by the time it reached the ear of those who were gathered around there, God had turned it over into their language, and they were all, because it says that we all hear the language that, you know, we, that we know from birth. No. And this idea that you get a angelic language when you pray, but only if you're praying in the spirit. Um, you must pray in the spirit and then God will give you this secret language. But you don't know what you're saying. At no time do you know what you're saying. And um, the point I've been making for the last couple of weeks with scripture is... When God confuses languages, it's not a blessing. It's a curse. It's God saying, uh-uh. And this is how it's going to be. So we, I mean, we looked at um, these places where God promised that he's going to send a nation as a form of judgment to Israel. And he said, it's going to be a nation whose tongue you don't know. And they're going to be talking and you won't have a clue what they're saying. 
He says it in Jeremiah 5, Deuteronomy 28. That's part of the blessing and cursing of the nations and so on. And um, just in case, I, I came across a verse. Turn to Deuteronomy 30. Boy, I shouldn't do this because I don't know exactly where it is. Um, yeah, okay, I found it right off the bat. Thank you, God. There, there would be some who would say, well, that curse was given to Israel and it doesn't apply to us. Look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 5. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. That means he's going to save them. He's going to save them. That's what that is. And the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy, that thou mayest live. Look at verse 7. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies. Ah, there it is. And on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. So, he's saying that if Israel gives their heart over to the Lord... And starts following the Lord. God's going to save them. He's going to circumcise their heart. He's going to forgive all of their sins. They're going to love the Lord their God. And all the curses that he would have given. One of them is a nation's going to come from the end of the earth. And it's a nation whose tongue they shall not understand. God says I'm going to give it to them. To the, other, to the Gentile nations. For hating you. And uh, so anyway, you might want to make a note of that and underline it. So now, um, Ezekiel chapter 3 um, is God telling Ezekiel, you know, he gave him the book. The book came down from heaven, the scroll came down from heaven. And he gives it uh, to Ezekiel and he says, Ezekiel, take it and eat it up. I mean, that's where we get the, the whole sweet roll thing. Where did mom get those sweet rolls at yesterday? Was that yesterday? I don't know. She had sweet rolls on her desk and I didn't have any on mine. <gasps> now I know. I see a guilty face back there. But anyway, verse in Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 4. He said unto me, Son of man, go get thee into the house of Israel and speak my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange language and of a hard, or a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. And, um, I, you know, we, we do mission work in Kenya. We do what we can over there. But I, I'm really not that good at learning languages. I didn't take any, the only language course I ever took was Greek. And um, so he says here, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. In other words, they'll be able to understand every word you say, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. And I would, make an, I would make an analogy just with our, our own church here that I've been preaching since 19, since September, October of 1990. Three years at Richwoods, and then the rest of it here. And, I mean, you've seen over the years, a lot of you, well, you've seen that we just never did have a big church. It seems like more and more nowadays, people don't care about church, they don't care about listening to preachers, they don't care about nothing but reading the Bible. They don't care about any of that. And yet what I found is I go to Kenya and when I go to Samburu to the All Saints Church, it's always full every time I go there. And as often as I go to Kenya, if, if I go to Kenya, they want me there at that church. 
And um, so the people who don't understand my English or they don't understand my accent, they're the ones who listen by the thousands. And But here in America, you just can't get people uh, to listen. And that's what he's saying here. And he said, verse 7, the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. And then... Uh, turn to Zephaniah. And this, I think, is something that is misunderstood. This is a prophecy concerning the last days. And a lot of people, well, I know the Jews believe this. And the Hebrew roots people believe this. Um... Kyle, have you ever run into Hebrew roots teaching? Um, there was a guy up in um, St. Peter's. His name was Jim Staley. And he was, uh, he was like an assistant pastor in, in some church up around that area. And he said one day, God gave him a vision and showed him how the church... All the churches in, in America, uh, he showed him a church that was all falling apart and the foundation was all bad and everything like that. And Christ was showing him this and Christ told him that that's the condition of the church and God's going to use him to, to rebuild it and restore it. And I'm going, uh, no, that's actually contrary to scripture. Because the foundation of God's church standeth sure. It's not falling apart. But he, he said he got a vision of this. And then one day, instantly was downloaded into his mind uh, the proper interpretation of books like Romans and Galatians. The Hebrew roots people, they're these Gentiles that believe. They've been told and they believe this. That the only way to understand really who Christ is, is from the Jewish perspective. You have to learn Jewish mannerisms. You must follow the Jewish customs. You've got to learn that, um, you know, do everything the way the Jews did. And then you'll get the right idea of who Jesus or they, excuse me, it's not Jesus. It's Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach. You get the real, the real truth about who he is. And I'm going, wait a minute. The Jews got it wrong. Their perspective of who Christ was, they said, kill him. He's not our Messiah. And uh, they believe that you keep as much of the law as you possibly can. And then God's grace then will fill in the cracks. And I'm like, and, and you know what happened to him? He was running a scam. He got into, what he did was, he took out like a $10 million life insurance policy on some old guy. And he sold shares to people to help him make the payments on it, waiting for this guy to kick off. And um, so that when this guy died, then everybody, they had it in paper. They were all supposed to get a portion of that 10 mil. Well, they didn't get nothing. And Jay Nixon ended up investigating him, tried him, arrested him, found him guilty, and threw him in prison for about six or seven years. And I did a, um, I did a, a video called uh, Sacred Name or Witchcraft. And I mentioned Jim Staley in that. I said, he's one of these sacred name guys. He says, you got to say Yeshua if you really want to talk to the right Savior. Well, that thing went out on a Sunday. Monday morning, there was a message on the church answer machine from Jim Staley saying, I did not say that. I do not believe that. I do not teach it. And I went, oh, you're lying. And I went to his church website and I found an article that he wrote. And in those words, he said it. And so I did a Pastor Mike online the next day and I'm going, gotcha. <laughs> but anyway, it's a big movement, especially around the country. Um, these people, they go and they have Passover seders. 
They, they say they follow all of the uh, dietary laws of the Bible. They follow the, the uh, feast days. They do everything that Jews do. And that makes them more special with God than everybody else. They boast, they boast on their works, just like Paul said. And uh, they would be the people who would tell you, God's going to restore the Hebrew language because he promised in Zephaniah 3. Well, let's, leave, let's read what it says. Zephaniah 3 in mind. For then will I turn to the people a pure language. A pure language. What language was it? He doesn't say. He doesn't say. That they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. And by the way, Staley and other guys like that would say, God's name is not the Lord. That's a title. In fact, and here's what they do. The word Baal means Lord. So all of you Gentile Christians out there who are calling on the Lord, you're actually praying to Baal. No. Jesus said it was the Lord. Paul said it was the Lord. Peter said it was the Lord. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John said it. It's the Lord. And, uh, but anyway, they, the, all these people believe, and the Jews believe, that God's going to restore Hebrew. The only problem with Hebrew is it has no vowels in it. No A, no letter for I, O, U, nothing. And so they had to add these little dots uh, with the word to show you what vowels should, should go in there. And... Um, so it means it has no breath. When God moved over to Greek, Greek has vowels in it. It has breath in it, the letters. So he said in Zephaniah 3.13, The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So I do. I do believe God is going to, he didn't say restore to them, their pure language. He said, for then will I turn to the people a pure language. In Mark chapter 16, verse 17, these, si these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, which was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. They're speaking all these tongues now that they don't know. They're new to them. They're speaking them, and lo and behold, there's a group of people out there that can understand what they're saying. And that was the marvel of it. How hear we these men in the language wherein we were born? So, now, um, Exodus 4. Here's how God characterizes the Old Testament. Because the main character of the Old Testament is Moses. Main character of the New Testament is Christ. And so in Exodus 4.10, Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, N neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Uh, the Bible is telling us later that he, was a, he stuttered. Uh, I got tickled one day with uh, Brother Sterling. Uh, we were, we had gotten a new builder. And this was an older guy that, uh, he's one of these guys, he built maybe, I don't know, four houses a year, something like that, you know. But he was a nice enough guy, but he stuttered real bad. Now Sterling, ever since I've known him, has had a hearing problem. It's from, he says it was from working in that boiler shop and it, everything being so loud in there. And it just damaged his ears. And he, he wouldn't wear his hearing aids to work because he didn't want to get paint. You know, we sprayed a lot of paint. He didn't want to get paint on him. And I got tickled at him one time. <laughs> and I think me and Steve set it up. But anyway, I said, Sterling, this guy wants to talk to you. <laughs> so the guy was trying to explain to Sterling what he wanted. And he was stuttering the whole time. And I could see Sterling going, what'd you say? And the guy would go... <clears throat> And he'd start all over again, stuttering, and Sterling would go, Do what now? Yeah. It was funny. Yeah. 
The only, yeah, the only thing worse than a man that can't hear very well is to have him talk to a man that can't talk very well either. And uh, anyway, we got our laughs. But anyway, he said in Isaiah 28, notice this in Isaiah 28, 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Okay, the stammering lips are Genesis through Malachi. It's the Old Testament in Hebrew because Moses stammered. He stammered. So this is what God, and if, let's read the context of Isaiah 28. Turn there. So you'll understand it better. This is one of those things, this is really at the heart of why God is doing what he's doing on the first day the Holy Spirit is poured out. I mean, God could have manifested anything on that day that the Holy Spirit does, okay? But on this day, he manifested these other languages, which was a sign to Israel, who didn't believe, that I'm going to be speaking to them. And you're not going to know what they're saying. So, in Isaiah 28... He talks about uh, the drunkards of Ephraim in verse 1. And then he says in verse 7, They have also erred through wine and through strong drink or out of the way. So what happens when a guy gets really, really good and drunk when he starts talking? Number one, he talks out of the side of his head. Number two, he can't control what he says. Number three... He can't speak it correctly. He slurs his speech. And, um, and that's what he's saying. They've erred through wine and through strong drink or out of the way, meaning Christ. He's the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They're swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. I mean, look at all these. If you take verse 7 and apply it to Bible doctrine, Bible reading, Bible understanding. Look at what there's, it's saying here. There is a spirit that is in them that, number one, will cause them to err. They will, they will not see things in the Bible that are there. They will look at parts of the Bible and say, oh, there must, there's a mistake here. and We're going to correct it with, with Greek. And then um, through strong drink or out of the way, that means they're not. They're not right with God. Some of them probably not even saved. And then they have erred through strong drink. They're swallowed up of wine. And they're out of the way again through strong drink. They err in vision. That means that, and I don't know if you've ever heard this statement, but as a pastor, I've heard this one several times. Well, I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see anything wrong with how I'm living. You know, preacher, you preached on this the other day, but, you know, we do that. Now, I don't see anything wrong with it. They err in vision. Now, if I'm making stuff up, that's one thing. But if I'm reading it right out of the text, then that's another. Uh, a lot of you know I had a situation last year where two people that should have known better decided that they were going to marry themselves on a cruise ship. Uh, no preacher, no captain of the ship, no license, nothing. They got to their room, looked at each other, and I don't, I, to this day, I don't know what they said because they never told me. But I guess they said, we're married. And that was it. And they said, we... And I asked one of them, I said, why is it that when you came back, you didn't tell me? You told other people, and they came and told me, but you didn't tell me. Well, we knew you'd have a problem with it. And I said, you were right, don't you? No, I don't see anything wrong with what we did. They, they err in vision. They stumble in their judgment. They made a judgment call and they stumbled. 
And I already knew the guy. I knew exactly why he didn't want a marriage certificate because he wanted a way out. Means that whenever he gets tired of her or she gets tired of him, see ya. And that's it. Don't have to get lawyers. Don't have to go before a judge. Nothing like that. And then it says in verse 8, all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. And then, verse 9, he changes it over. So whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? So God says, okay, I've got these Ephraimites and they're drunks and they will not learn my doctrine. They will not learn my teachings. Is there anybody out there who wants to learn what God has to teach and is there anybody out here that God can make to understand doctrine raise your hand amen God I don't care if I'm wrong I don't care I want to know it your way them that are weaned from the milk Drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Why is he saying that? Because that's how we read the Bible. We read it here a little, and we go over here and we read there a little, and we have precept over here and precept over here. And if that's not enough, we have Isaiah uh, chapter 34, I believe. Uh, where he said, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, no one of these fa shall fail, none shall want her mate. And for everything you see in the Old Testament, there's a, there's a verse mated to it in the New Testament. But then he says, verse 11, then for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. So by the time that Christ died and rose again, um, the Jews as a nation having uh, rejected Christ, they just put him out and said, we're not following you anymore. And um, so from that point forward, there at Pentecost, God sends a very powerful symbol. I'm gonna speak to all of these people who come from all these Gentile nations from all over the place, and they're gonna understand my doctrine. But to you, I mean, my goodness, Jesus spoke from the cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. It's Hebrew or Aramaic. And how many people at the base of the cross understood what he was saying? None of them. They said, oh, he's calling for Elias. But that's not what he was calling for. He was quoting Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they didn't understand it. Had they understood it, they would have said, because in Psalm 22 is, they parted my garments and cast lots for my vesture. That's in Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and feet. That's in Psalm 22. And there's like two or three other prophecies of the cross in Psalm 22. Anybody who would have understood what Jesus was saying there on the cross, would have got it. And they would have said, that's our Messiah. There he is, right there. And they and would have turned. But for some reason, God withheld it from them. Nobody could figure out what he was saying. That's not the only time Jesus did that. He did that once where he said, Talita kumi, damsel arise. Um, is there another one? Huh? No. He, well, the, the tel, to telestai is the Greek word for it is finished. He didn't say Greek. No. Uh -uh. Um, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know what, I know what you're talking about now. But anyway, so God is sending a clear message here with stammering lips, Moses, and another tongue, Greek. He will, will he speak to his people? 
And then in Isaiah 32, the eyes of them that shall uh, that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken or hearken. The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge. That's good because I had a big rash yesterday. It was like all over my neck and you wanted to hear that, didn't you? The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. So when we read Moses, we get it. We understand Moses is the lawgiver. Christ is the new lawgiver. Aaron's the high priest from the tribe of Levi. Jesus is the high priest from the tribe of the, uh, from the tribe of Judah, from the order of Melchizedek. And on and on and on. Because we have this New Testament written in a Gentile language with vowels in it. I keep saying that because Paul said that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And when he said the letter killeth, Hebrew is a, is a consonant alphabet. No vowels in it at all. No breath in it. But Greek is a voweled language. It has breath sounds in it. Okay? And uh, so he added the spirit to his word and... You and I have that spirit when we read and study and think upon God's word. Uh, let's see, did I already read that? Yeah, I already read that. Isaiah 33. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Thine heart shall meditate terror. Where is the scribe? Where is the receiver? Where is he that counted the towers? Thou shalt not see a fierce people. A people of deeper, that fierce people, I think, is the nation of fierce countenance from Deuteronomy 28. Thou shalt not see a fierce people, a people of deeper speech than thou canst perceive, of a stammering tongue that thou canst not understand. In other words, God has given us understanding of his word. I mean, you know, I, here I am. Nine years old, I'm at a Bible camp down in Missouri and, and I come to the altar and I'm listening to the preacher give me the verses. And I asked Jesus into my heart. Jesus came, God washed all my sins away. And um, I'll never forget that night, hopefully as long as I live. Because God gave a little nine-year-old boy enough understanding to know that he was a sinner, but Christ died for the sinners. And God forgives the sins. And uh, I understood that. And um, I, I can understand the stammering tongue now. And so, um, oh, we already read that. Um, yeah, this, look at this. 11, the number 11... Is the number for confusion. Uh, and it's in Isaiah 28, 11, where he says, With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And if you go back to Genesis 11, that you have the story of the Tower of Babel. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And in verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Why did he call it Babel? Huh? What is it? Automyopia? Huh? Yeah. Babel. The word babble means you this. You um, that's why I called it babble. Because they it just you know how you listen to somebody else's language and you go, that sounds stupid. <laughs> Alright? And then when it huh? 
Yeah, well, when they see us and hear us, they go, them Americans, man, they don't know how to talk. Yeah. Um, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And again, that's not a blessing. So, um, um, Hebrews 7, I, I want to finish with this, because this is, to me makes sense. God made it clear in Hebrews 7, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also the law. In other words, the Old Testament said that the priesthood must come from the tribe of Levi. No other tribe. Levi was the third born son. Okay. Judah is fourth. That number always speaks to the spiritual realm and the gospel. So from Judah comes Christ. And there is nothing in the Old Testament that allows for a priest to be from the tribe of Judah. There's nothing in the law that gives an allowance for that. And that's why, that's why Paul writes that here for the priesthood being changed. God deliberately and you know, in front of everybody, change the priesthood. Now Christ is of the order of Melchizedek. You have two groups of thought on this, that Melchizedek and Christ are the same thing. I think Melchizedek is uh, an angel in heaven and uh, an exalted angel and the order of the priesthood in heaven is named after him. The order of Melchizedek. Um, and Christ then is the forever high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, and it doesn't really hurt anything if you believe that Jesus is Melchizedek. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, I just, I think it's. I think Christ isn't Melchizedek, but I know definitely that Christ is the high priest from that order. If you look in uh, Revelation, anytime you see this scene in heaven, you've got angels. Well, you have it in Isaiah 6. Um, uh, I, the, Isaiah sees the Lord in heaven and the, chair, uh, the seraphim around him. And... Um, Isaiah says, woe am I for I'm a man of unclean lips. Well, an angel goes over and grabs a tongue and gets a coal from the, from the altar. Well, that angel is in the priesthood in heaven. That's his job. And so there is an entire order of angels that are the priests in heaven. They tend to the temple. They tend to the, the altar, as it were, and so on. You see them in the book of Revelation. You see them in Isaiah 6, and so on. And so that order of angels called the order of Melchizedek. And so, again, Christ coming from Judah instead of Levi tells you God's changing everything from the earthly to the spiritual. Okay? And so in 1 Corinthians 14, in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips. Now, let's, let's go back and look at this. Turn back to uh, Isaiah 28, 11. You know what I ought to do, John? Remind me tomorrow, and I'll look this verse up in the Septuagint and see what it says in Greek. Isaiah 28, 11. Because... Look at the difference. In Isaiah 28, 11, God says, For the stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. But here Paul is... I think I've looked this up. Paul quoted it differently. With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Did Paul change the Bible? No. Huh? It's different. But remember, who was Paul getting his words from? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, said Paul, 
write this down. Or actually, Paul say this, and the guy who was writing it down for Paul wrote it down. Because Paul couldn't see. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. And so what, what was meant to provoke the Jews to jealousy on the day of Pentecost. Here's the Holy Ghost coming poured down upon these men. And they're all speaking these languages. The Jews should have looked at that. The Hebrew speaking Jews should have looked at that and said, uh oh. God is pouring out his blessing and his spirit upon these people who don't keep the law. We should be jealous over that, but they weren't. They just did what all the, the, uh, the high-ranking uh, men of the Pharisees and the Sadducees did the whole time Christ was on. We've got to find some way of killing him. He's making us look bad. In other words, they're not going to change. We just need to kill him so we don't lose our power over the people. That's religion in this world. That's religion. I don't care what religion it is and how nice it looks on the outside. It's men or women who are ruling over other people's everlasting soul. That's more than a government has. Governments can only take your money and your land and your guns and everything else. But religions can take your soul. Those, those guys are dangerous. And so it's with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. So wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, meaning Israel. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Uh, Chuck Smith, does anybody know who that is? Chuck Smith, the, um, it's the denomination, it's not a denomination. What church is, what church are they at? Uh, did he start? Um, yeah, in California. Calvary, yeah, Calvary Chapel. The Calvary Chapel churches. I have a recording of Chuck Smith saying, he's reading, he's reading verse 22. And he says, when it says here that tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. I like the way J.B. Phillips has it. He reverses it and says that tongues are for a sign uh, to them that believe not. No, no. Uh, he, he reverses it. He says that tongues are a sign uh, to them that believe, not to them that believe not. He just rearranged the knots. And he changes, changes what it means, but that doesn't, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. All right, I'll let you all go. We need to pray. How much more have I got here? Yeah, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Somebody tell me. If you can read these letters, I mean, when God confuses languages, he really confuses languages. And what I marvel at is with all of the people in the world who speak English, we have a hard time understanding like somebody who has a real, real thick Scottish accent. Man, we can't understand hardly half of what they say. Um, so that's why, that's what I had to learn going to Kenya. I'm going, you guys all speak English, right? Why do I need an interpreter? And finally somebody said, they can't understand you. What? Everybody understands American. I did. That's what I thought. But yeah, that's your, that's your languages there. It you, you doesn't, doesn't help to just know the words. You've got to know the alphabet, the aleph bet. Because that's what it is in Hebrew. Aleph, bet. And it's backwards. It goes away from the New Testament, not toward it. It goes away from the Gospels, not toward the Gospels. 
Greek takes you right back to the gospel. 